be our live. Liz, Liz, I'm coming here in the studio. You definitely, you, oh, no, I was going to mention something I said I wouldn't mention on the icebreaker. I'm not going to mention it. The oh, thing, you have to, die. No, I'm not going to mention it. No, <laughs> I was going to say you were definitely on time. There was no issues with time. No, definitely Nothing, here no on time. Whatsoever. Definitely on time. Yeah. I love how punctual the RAF are. Yeah, always on time. <laughs> Never break. <laughs> Never delayed. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, so, I don't know if you're aware. Uh, I think your first your first Afghan tour yeah. was the same time as my first Afghan Aww. tour. Oh, I was six the year before. What did you say? Yeah. What did you say that for? Oh no, it's like oh. it's like old friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I was trying to think. I was trying to think if I could remember a female crewman. Yeah, crew person. No crewman. crewman. Yeah, that okay. was the job. Yeah, a female crewman on uh, on any of the on any of the uh, flights must have been. I just can't remember. I just yeah. can't remember. Well, we used to know when we had a female on the back of the aircraft because you could smell them. Females in the back, you know, they used to come on and they'd be like doused in perfume getting on at Kandahar Bastion. And even the pilot, she used to be like, have we got a female on? I'd be like, yes, we've got one. And they're like, put her in the jump seat, put her in the jump seat. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I didn't wear a perfume because I just always stank of hydraulic fluid the whole time. So you probably didn't smell me. <laughs> so you might not have even noticed. <laughs> and back, those were back in the days where we could fill the aircraft up with like just literally from floor, floor to ceiling. So the chances of you actually seeing me if I was at one end or the other were slim to none. But yeah, it must be there at the same time then. So, did you experience much uh, sexism when you were serving? I was really, you know what? I was going to say I was really lucky. I think in the forces, sexism really doesn't exist. I mean, that's a sweeping statement. But oh. nine times out of ten, people just get on with the fucking job, don't they? And I think you know, I've never been made to feel. I mean, I always got asked to do the like classic token female, like wheel out the Doris for like a TV interview and stuff like that. But I was really lucky that I had my accent. Wheel and I could, out the Doris. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> token bird. But I, because I'm from Northern Ireland, I could play the Joker card and say, look, I really don't want, you know, my face to be on TV or on the radio. And I made a point throughout my career of never being, you know, used as that. But, I, you know, I was never once made to feel like the weaker sex for being a female. It was always just as long as you crack on with the job and you got on with it and you're credible and kind of one of the team. I mean, as long as you're not Jack and it doesn't matter if you're male or female, you can be Jack as fuck whether or not you're a man or a woman. So as long as you're not Jack and you get on with the team, then I was always treated the same as everyone else. And I didn't really see it with any anybody else. You know, I, I, there was very few females did my job in the heyday. There was five of us. And I remember having to queue for the girls' toilets in the squadron, which was like a first ever. That never happened on a flight safety day once. But um, yeah, we were all made, a, we were all just treated exactly the same as everyone else. I had so much respect as well whenever coming back to females in the back of the aircraft. In the early days of Herrick, you would carry, like we would see maybe one female every three weeks or something. We would carry a female around, like up to the fobs or whatever. So it was really unique. But by the end of Herrick, like the last couple of tours I did, Nearly every time we lifted, there'd be like a female, either dog handler or medic or someone on the back of the aircraft. It was so, it wasn't unique anymore. And they'd be carrying the same kit that all the lads were carrying and going out into the bondi when we dropped the ramp. And I always used to have so much respect for them and think, you know, fucking hell, girl, you're really pulling your weight and, and just cracking on with it. So, yeah, but it's definitely, um, it's a good career for a female to go into the forces. And I think that really breaks perception, maybe from the outside world looking in. But it's been, you know, I've always felt very embraced in the forces. This is quite at odds. The reason I asked the question is it's quite at odds with, with what Hannah Shergold said um, on one of the podcasts that she, yeah. she'd been on twice now. And um, but her experience is very, very, very different. And I think uh, that's not, I'm not saying your experience is bullshit or hers experience is bullshit. Yeah. It's just very, it's very perception. different. And totally different jobs as well. So do you know of Hannah? No, no, no. But I do think it's perception. You know, her perception, I, we used to like, we did an all female fly pass once and we couldn't even get enough females on the wing at the time to do that. So we had a female pilot, a male pilot who, we, who was called Dave and we called him Davina for the purposes of the BBC commentary. And then Glenda and me and Glenda was Glenn. But, the BBC thought it was four females. Anyway, when we taxied in and parked the aircraft up, you know, there was loads of banter about it parking up on it, you know, they parked it wonky and this, that and the other. And you used to get loads of banter, but it's, I think it's your own perception of what you perceive as banter and lighthearted banter. I mean, I got called Doris my entire career and I thought it was a really, like it was a, a very, you know, um, endearing term, but you could equally as perceive that as being a very insulting term. And it's all about your own perception, I think. So I completely see where she would have been coming from because you could take those things on board and go, that's really derogatory, that's really insulting. But from my point of view, I just find it actually a bit of a laugh sometimes because you give it as good as you get, you give it back. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
But yeah. I must listen to hers and see what see what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. She was a pilot. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think uh, I think when we spoke on that, when we, when we talked about it, we talked about it off air there as well. I think I don't know. I I I would like to think that she just her her journey through the her military career, her journey through. She just got the shit. I just I just I want to think. Yeah, she just got the shit under the stick yeah. in terms of that sexism because what she experienced was not nice, like not nice at all. But at the same time, I, I, um, I, I, I'm sort of on, in line with your thinking. Is that for the most part? I thought it was. If you crack on, you're all right. Yeah, I think, I think you know. it's definitely got better. I mean, from my early days, I remember getting one of my S jars. You know, like your yearly report and saying, you know. Sergeant McConaughey is a young female blonde from Northern Ireland. You just can't write that stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, What's the relevance of that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, and it was, I was just so, because it was so unique to have a female in my job at the, in the early days. But I think, yeah, and you had also a lot of old crusty guys, you know, still like knocking around on the wing. Whereas now it definitely has changed. I think everyone's kind of like, you know, and that doesn't just go for the forces. I think just generally in those kind of male jobs, you know, a lot of STEM jobs and engineering, you know, even oil rigs, I think, and stuff like that. You know, there's just more chicks getting in amongst it and cracking on with it. So, diversity, yeah. like a, a, a diverse workforce, is a is a more productive workforce than one that is as focusing on one particular demographic or subgroup Absolutely. of demographics. One hundred percent. Anyway, getting more serious for a minute. Coming off the sexism piece, uh, Afghan two thousand and six, Helmand, uh, we were, you mentioned uh, Kajaki off air. Just generally, as yeah. in flying a Kajaki Dami, I think you had a pretty hair raising experience there. Um, later on, 06, obviously had the the incident, the what well, three power refers to as the day of days, where uh, lost Mark Wright and then a bunch of people um, seriously uh, wounded. What was the impact of that day on the Chinook? What'd you call it? Flight force. F the yeah. Chinook force. The Chinook force. If yeah. there was any, because there was, there's all sorts of controversies surrounding that incident. Uh, one, you know, an aspect on the <clears throat> on the air on the air support, and there's also stuff on the ground, all sorts. Yeah. So, talk to me. I um, it did have an impact in that the Chinook force kind of we pride ourselves on being, we used to refer to it as the like supporting the lowest common denominator. So the guy on the ground in the ditch who hasn't got a vote, you know, just get that guy off the ground and back to where he needs to be or recover him if he's injured. And that's like kind of our sole reason for living, you know, our sole purpose in life and especially on Mert. So when that incident happened, it was, um, it wasn't my crew, but I do know the crew that were involved in that. And the afterwards, well, anyway, the, the, the actions of what happened that day and having people, you know, killed and injured, it is always going to impact everyone because even when I was out in theatre, if I wasn't on a merch shout, but you knew a British trip had been killed, it, it hits you in the gut regardless of whether or not you've been involved. But um, because the Chinook was involved and, and after the event, it, the blame started to get pointed towards the Chinook saying off the mines a lot. And then obviously there was the investigation. Um, and the Chinook wing actually did a lot of testing after that on against their downwash versus mines. And... The, the outcome of that was that there's no way they could have set that mine off by the testing that they'd done. Now, obviously, you can replicate stuff all the time out of the actual event, but um, the, the actual testing, they, they said they couldn't replicate um, them setting off the mine. But the crew involved, you know, they will be questioning everything, you know, from, from wanting just to be there to help the guys in the ground to certainly be blamed for killing them was really hard for the guys on board um, and they all had to go through the investigation they all had to you know every, whenever you're involved in any air incident everything gets pulled apart you know you're, how long you've been asleep your crew rest did you go to the gym that day even though it's absolutely no relevance on what's happened your logbook gets pulled everything gets pulled you know what's going on at home and you're literally under the spotlight for months on end so it had a really detrimental effect on some of those guys and um I mean, I think they're through it now. A lot of them are still in the wing, actually. But that's how the outcome of the, the whole investigation was that the Chinook couldn't have set it off. And I know that there were people, people like yourself, you know, who were involved in it, who can, you know, say it absolutely was. And it comes back to that perception thing. You know, none of us, bar the people that were there that day, were there. And, you know, I think the thing about, you know, again, perception and truth is that no one's truth is wrong. It's how you believe and perceive the whole event to happen. So, um but yeah, I don't know what it's felt like on the other side now, whether or not they still think that it was the Chinook that set it off. And 
I'm not sure. I would imagine that some people do think and some people don't. I mean, the, the reality of the situation is you'll never know. No. You know uh, and the reality of the situation is that, that you know, you'd like to think that day would, should never have happened. It would never happen again. And, 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 and unfor But unfortunately, it did. And people always want a, like, a hook to blame, don't they? And it's not that they want to make people culpable, but to be able to, like, process your grief and process your trauma, you almost need to have a reason why it happened. And... You know, even if it's not a blame you're putting on, you need a reason. So it might be easier for people to accept the whole event if they have that reason why it happened. And that reason can, could be the Chinook. And it's just easier for them to hook into that. So I completely get that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what was your most memorable incident on the... Uh, now, I know we spoke about this briefly in the icebreaker. Let's go into a little bit more detail, though, on this. Yeah. How does a Chinook come to get wrapped up... <laughs> In power lines. Yeah. Especially if there's no female driving. There no, was no female driving, was there? I know, exactly. We should have seen them. <laughs> I was busy doing my lipstick down the back, which what? is why I didn't see them. I was, yeah, put my mascara on. No, so, what year um, was it? What year was it? It was 07, I think. Right, talk to me. Yeah, so I was still in 27 Squadron then, which was my first squadron. And um, it was really early days for me in, in Afghan. I think it was my second tour, maybe. Maybe third. No, I think it was second. And... Um, so wires in the UK, we always refer to them as helicopter killers. And before we do any night flying in the UK, we will go and recce the route. So we'll fly the route by day. We will check that the, all the wires that we see on the ground are marked on the map. These days we use moving maps. So all of the wires all around the UK should be input onto those moving maps. They kind of get uploaded by the flight safety cell. Um, and But we still have to check because the odd time you'll get a set of slung wires through a valley or somewhere, especially in Wales, and they haven't had time to put them on the map system yet. So, you know, if they've gone up three days beforehand, they will literally pull a helicopter out of the sky. And anything pretty much smaller than a Chinook is probably not going to survive a wire strike. Um, but a Chinook has got wire cutters fitted to the front of the, the, the head, uh, like on the cockpit. So he slides the wires up and then cuts them doesn't always work and it depends how high like how high tension the wires are um so we're really careful about wires it's like our biggest kind of you know hazard to the helicopter fleet anyway that fateful day in Kajaki we were dropping up some underslung loads to um Sparrowhawk which is one of the drop sites up there there was three kind of underslung load drop sites and uh the other aircraft had been in and gone we dropped our underslung load off and then released it I was in the front door and my friend Logie was in the hatch at the time. So released the load. And just as we're transiting out of the um, landing area or the drop point, literally the next thing I heard was this one mighty bang and looked out into the three o'clock and there was a set of like 250 foot wires. So the big high, high voltage ones sparking in the three o'clock of the aircraft, jumping around in the air and sparking. And we'd hit them. So, this, so what was the bang? Just them breaking. Right, okay. So the... I mean, I remember the first thing I remember was the smell of burning electric You know that horrible smell where you've mangled your toaster or something like that horrible, horrible smell. And it filled the whole aircraft. I looked over my shoulder and Roley, or uh, Logie, my crewmate, had nearly gone through the centre hatch. So he managed to get himself back through because he was on his monkey harness that attaches you to the airframe. So he pulled himself back through the hatch. And the whole aircraft was now wallowing towards the ground. And up there, obviously you've been, it's not flat ground it's all undulating sand dunes and um and we were just like basically wallowing towards it why out of control so we didn't know at the time i thought we had ripped the aft pylon off the aircraft was so out of control i thought we'd rip the aft pylon and off. the aft pylon is what the rear rotor sits on right? yeah okay yeah so that's the kind of the way the aircraft was handling and maneuvering that's what i thought had happened i thought we're going in um our pilot at the time just kept saying i can't see i can't see and I held the front of my harness because the harness used to be attached by two little like, kind of um, webbing straps that used to fit through into a buckle. So I had those in my hand ready to pull them to release myself because I thought we were going to like hit the deck and roll the whole aircraft. And I thought the only way I'm going to survive this is if I get out of the aircraft as it rolls. And then at about 15 to 20 feet off the deck, Marty Locke, who was in the left-hand seat, he went, I have control. I managed to pull power. And we essentially, from sinking towards the ground uncontrollably, pulled in power and climbed. And what had happened was the, the cockpit had kind of come in around Aaron, who was the handling pilot, so he couldn't see anything. All the glass had gone into his eyes. Um, oh, the, the glass had been shattered. Yeah, the so it, it is actually, um, uh, like, um, it's not bulletproof at all, but it's kind of reinforced glass, but it, yeah, it's still shattered and come in on, on, over, all over him. Um, 
So we managed to pull back up into the air, but still not really knowing what damage we'd done. Now, if that had ever happened in the UK, the first thing you do is land on, shut down the aircraft and do a full walk around. The engineers come out and inspect it because it's like your car. You know, when you have a, a prang in your car, you don't really know what you've done to the chassis. You don't know what else, what other damage you've done. So in the UK, we would absolutely land on. Not quite so easy when you're in Kajaki and you're in Afghanistan and you've got a 45 minute journey back to Bastion. So we essentially um, flew back to Bastion, limped back to Bastion very carefully um, with our playmate, the other Chinook, because in the early days before the Apaches kind of got involved, we would go everywhere as a two ship. So there'd be one Chinook uh, with a playmate for mutual co mutual cover, essentially. And it meant that if we ever went down anywhere in the desert, playmate could come and land on and pick you and, the, and all your passengers up and kind of get you back to somewhere safe. So the playmate kind of flew along beside us, checked out all the engines from outside, um, you know, checked the aft pylon for from us from above and, and underneath and stuff. And um, and we got back to Bassey and landed on and shut down. But that was the longest 45 minutes of my life. And we always carry a go bag in Afghan. So back here in the UK, it's usually some kind of dancing rig for a night out in wherever you're going to get stuck. Whereas in Afghan, it's just bullets and ammunition, really. And um, and they sit on like a stretcher shelf that we've got in the aircraft. So I moved my go bag and put it right beside me. Um, just because I thought if we go in, we're probably, you know, on, you know, on foot outrunning someone <laughs> and they're down behind enemy lines, which it uh, was not where we wanted to be. So, um, yeah, we got back to Bastion, parked the aircraft up. And then my brother was actually out there at the time. He worked with the Remy on the Lynx step and, uh, he came over the next day to the Merc tent and went, um, Liz, have you seen that Chinook parked up in the hangar? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he said, he goes, who's in that? They're lucky to be alive. And I went, yeah, don't tell mom. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but that was it. You know, it was the nearest thing. It, you know, it's that, um, the instant kind of like shock and trauma, but then that 45 minutes of just like aching out going any minute, not I, something's going to catastrophically fail. But, but the Chinook's a battlefield helicopter. It's pretty robust. You know, I've seen people take a foot and a half off some of the blades before and, um, no. and it still flies. Yeah. Yeah, I say I've got a mate who actually went into a landing site in the UK and took down a tree <laughs> with one of the blades and managed to fly it back. And you know, we've had RPGs go through the blades and they've managed it flies like a bag of shit, flies like a bag of nails, but it'll still fly. And it's got two engines, so if you lose an engine, nine times out of ten in Afghan, we can still fly with one of the engines packed up. It'd be a bit of a it'd be a running landing instead of into the hover because you wouldn't be able to come to the hover, but you can still get back. It's a really good aircraft. I've never felt as safe anywhere in my life as the back of a chinook. That's crazy. A question for you, which popped into my mind last week for some reason. It was why was I thinking? Why was I thinking about chinooks? I can't remember. I was probably reading your bloody book. <laughs> I think I know the answer, and I think it's to the to do with the angle of the blades. Oh, it's going to be a hard question. Uh, it's not it? hard, right? I know how a I know how a normal helicopter steers. Yeah. Right, because you got the rear rotor. Yeah, and it's all about cyclic rate and all yeah, that. Compared, yeah, 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 compared to the to the, the main rotor. Right? Yeah. Well, a Chinook has two. I would, I would call them two main rotors. Yeah. On top, how does it steer? So essentially, <laughs> they both go in opposite directions. So one goes clockwise, yeah. the other one goes anti-clockwise. Oh. And then if you want to go forward, the heads tilt forward ever so slightly, and it'll pull you essentially forward through the air. If you want to go left or right, you just pull the stick left or right, and it'll tilt the whole heads and it's basically rotating swash splits on each head so all of the blades tilt in one angle which means that the lift that you create on those blades gets pushed out in a different way so say you want to go off to the right push the stick to the right everything moves to the right and the lift that you're creating gets pushed off so like from the right underneath the aircraft so. were you ever allowed to fly the helicopter have you seen my parking <laughs> No, I uh, I flew the um, the aircraft in a sim quite a few times because we got a sim up at RAF Benson. We've actually now got one at Odium as well, which I worked in briefly. But um, yeah, I've flown the sim a few times and it takes some going to crash the sim. I mean, you've got to be really giving it beans to be able to crash the sim. And I've done that a few times. <laughs> so no, I have been offered the odd time because back in, I mean, it's a little bit different now. There's a lot more red tape now. But certainly in the old days, we used to do a lot of exercises in Morocco and we had like an Olympic Games day where we had to get a crewman in as a pilot and they flew a circuit and they got marks out of 10. And then the pilot had to be a crewman and try and balance the aircraft wheel on a an egg and squash an egg. And we did all those kind of games, you know, just like switching up roles, which is actually really good because it certainly gives you a massive believer in that. I even think around station, um, people should switch roles a bit more, you know, because if we, you, um, we used to get the shittest sandwiches in the world when we used to go flying from Odium for the day. So you'd be off flying. <laughs> you'd be off flying for like 12, day, 12 hours. 
<laughs> your main get... complaint, your yeah. main complaint is former RAFers used to get the shittest sandwiches. Oh, you can't tell me you haven't got a butty box before <laughs> I'm gone. Seriously, mate, it's like it's their own food they're giving out. Because you used to get like a cheese and tomato sandwich and you get cheese in it and like one slice of tomato and be like, seriously, this is my only meal for the whole 12 hours you're airborne. But I thought if we took that chef or whoever was making the sandwiches flying for a day and said, here's what you've got for the next 12 hours, they'd be like, well, this is shit. I'll make you better ones next time. And equally, if we went and worked in the cook house for a day and some wanker came in at midnight and went and ate 24 butty boxes at six o'clock in the morning, you'd be like, twats. So, you know, I just think that cross-contamination of roles is really important. So, yeah, we did that quite a lot on the on the back of the aircraft. But, but no, coming back to the original question, no one ever entrusted me with the uh, the um, the, the uh, handling of a Chinook, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> you preferred it in the back, though, right? Yeah, and, it, you know, I always wanted to be a crewman um, from my very early days of joining up. And I think even if I had done my aptitude tests at Cranwell and got, like, you've got the aptitude to be the first ever female red arrow, I still would have gone, yeah, but a Chinook's killer, isn't it? And I want to be a Chinook crewman. Mm. So I just loved it. You know, if you... It's got the best seat in the house, you know, put the ramp down, especially in Afghan on a nice, you know, you finish your tasking for the day, you're heading back to Bastion or in the early days back to Kandahar. Feet are dangling over the edge, sat in your harness and got no worries in the world. You know, you're above the threat at 3,000 feet. Uh, it's warm. You know, you haven't got a call sign. I was used to say, if you haven't got a call sign, you can't get in trouble. So that's why. <laughs> so, <laughs> no call sign, no worries. Um, but, you know, you get to, it's called the shop floor. You know, we get to see all the troops that come over the ramp. You know, in the Mert, we, get, we got to see some of the, you know, the worst things, yes. But also some of the really good stories as well. You know, guys, you know, um, guys coming back to life in the back of the aircraft. That was quite, you know, we, that happened as well as guys taking their last breath. And yeah, that a lot of that trauma has stayed with a lot of crewmen for life and it will do. But, you know, the the thumbs up and the engagement you get as guys run off the ramp or run back over the ramp is just, you know, it's worth it. It makes the job absolutely, you know, the purpose so much, you know, more worthwhile. And the pilots don't get that. They're just strapped to the front of it like... Mm essentially taxi drivers in a big green bus. Mm. So I really enjoy that engagement with, you know, this pretty much the British Army because we spent, you know, most of my career supporting them. Yeah. Yeah, the Mertz, in, the Mertz thing's interesting, isn't it? I spoke to, uh, I interviewed a guy called Tom Martinson and Tom Martinson is, um, he's ex at Yeah. And he's also, he suffers with, complex PTSD he's a filmmaker now he spends a lot of time in Africa to film in like conservation um, f- films and documentaries and stuff that orientated to the African wildlife uh, but he ended up spending a, an unusually long period of time on the Mert teams yeah normally it would be a period of X amount of weeks you would do it for and then rotate off rotate back on rotate back off and whatever circumstances came about he sp- he individually ended up spending time on there for months and months and months and months and months and um, I had never really considered it before. One of the things I think, one of the things with people who are on the ground in Afghan, and especially on the infantry side, you always you tend to think you always had it worse than anyone else, or you always experienced the w- harder things than anyone else did. Yeah. I think generally. Well, we all do that in life, don't we? Oh, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe you, you want you don't want to think that you're special. Maybe but you want to think, yeah, I've experienced shit. You haven't, kind of yeah. thing. And I'd never really thought about the Mert side of things until he started. He the way he explained the Mert thing is. The Mert thing. The way he explained Mert is, he said, when you were flying in on a Mert mission, you were flying into someone's worst nightmare. Yeah. You were literally entering their worst nightmare. It's yeah. like, there's sh- there's a shitstorm going on and you're going into that. And the Mert team do it repeatedly. Yeah. And every time you go out, it's, fuck, what yeah. are we going into? And when he said that, I think, holy shit, yeah. And I would not want to do that, thank you very much. No, thank you. No. I mean, I'd do it if I had to. And I'd do it for, and I, I need like an honour to be put onto that team. But if I had a choice of that or what I did, yeah, like I'll take what I did all day long. And it's so funny because I would never have done what you did. And um, <laughs> But yeah, Mert, whenever the early days in Mert, so the very early days in Afghan, um, it was really quite quiet, like the first year or so, because there wasn't that many British troops on the ground. You know, we had Lashkagar, Goresh, we had um, Bastion was just being built, and then we mainly worked at a Kandahar. So Mert was really quiet. We should just explain quickly: Mert team, be a medical evacuation response team. Yeah, for people who don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um. So much so actually that we used to put. So there was one aircraft based out of Bastion, which was just a barbed wire fence at the time. It looked like something out of Star Wars because you drive around Bastion. It was no roads or anything. It was just dust. Um. And we would have one crew down there holding Mert, um, living out of a tent with two para, 
And I mean, there's a story in the book about, you know, them, me going for, have you heard the story about me going for a shower in the morning and then me coming out in the mall being naked? What month was this? Um, oh, fuck knows. I don't know. It's one of the early, early. Yeah, it would have been one of the really early. Three power. Yeah. Was it, was it three power? It was three. Yeah, it was three power. And I was on that advance party. Ah. But I was not naked. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But that's again, you know, come back to it. That, that was brilliant banter. That I, every morning, basically for anyone listening who hasn't read the book, I'd get into the, there was the cattle grid showers, you know, there was like metal row of showers and there was one curtain at the end of them. So being the only female there, I one of the lads used to come with me and like guard the curtain. So I'd go in in the morning and the first morning I was there, all the lads were like brushing their teeth at the sinks, those crappy like metal sinks. And, uh, I went in for a shower, got out, and they were all completely naked, still brushing their teeth, totally non emotional just sat there. And I was like, brilliant. Next day, same thing. And this little dance went on for weeks, but it was just, it was, you know, like hard for fun. And I, you know, that was a bit of banter. You can't take offense for that. It was like, I'm not going to complain. They're all naked. <laughs> it's great. But um, yeah, so in the early days, Mark was really quiet. And then it started to ramp up because obviously the more we sang in was basically what kicked it off. And then after sang in and we started to push up, you know, the noise ad and musicala, things started to get really tasty. And we originally held the duty for a week at a time. And it was 15 minutes notice to move during the day and 30 minutes notice to move at night time. For moot, yeah. Yeah. And I think as well as <coughs> what you were referring to about what you're going into, so you're going into like the shock and awe of someone's worst day, like you say, and we would lift sometimes and only have a grid. And then on the way there, we would get the information through of like, you've got two, T2, two T1s, a T3 and a T2, or you would have a T3 that was becoming a T1. You know, it would, it would just always change on the way there on the radio. Um, and it was very rarely just one casualty. It was usually like a mixture of casualties. Sometimes when you change from Bastion Radio to the TAC Radio to the guys on the ground, you would hear them, whoever was chatting on the radio would be essentially running with the stretcher and you could hear them hanging out their hoop while they're trying to recover or get the casualty to the landing site where we were going to pick them up. And you, you'd hear it through the radio and knowing that you're going in there. But on the other side of that, we would then have the Apaches feeding us in the, the ICOM chatter. So they would be picking up whatever the Taliban are saying. And they used to say, do you want to hear it? And it was like a double-edged sword because sometimes we'd be like, yeah, we need to know what's going on. And they'd be like, right, we can see the mosquito. And they used to call the Apaches mosquitoes. The Taliban did. Yeah. And they called us the fat cow. And they'd say, I can see the mosquitoes. There's two of them. Yeah, I can see the fat cow. Get the big gun ready. And you'd be like listening to this coming in one ear. And then you'd be listening to the guys on the ground in the other ear and thinking, we, we're going in. There's no way we're never not going to go in. And the, the whole Chinook force would never have not gone somewhere out of their own will. You know, the times that we ever get held off was because some brigade commander somewhere had said the threat, losing a whole Chinook and all the people on board, that is worth, you know, it's too, too, too risky right now. We have to wait. But, um, yeah, so you've got all this coming into the cockpit and into the aircraft. And, um, yeah, like some days on Mert were like scenes of mash. You know, my worst day had 14 shots back to back pretty much. And you'd get, get the the the, um, the nine liner, get the... Um, the casualty, get them back to Nightingale, which was the HLS back at Bastion. And literally on the way back in with one casualty, you'd be getting another nine liner through in the radio. Nine times out of 10, the same place. And you'd have to go back to the same place again and see the same guys bringing a stretcher on and having to take them back to Bastion. And it was just relentless. And, you know, I think even just seeing the guys bring the stretchers on, you know, them having to run back out into the battlefield, I just I remember thinking, there's nothing I can say to them. If they, even if they brought their mate on who's already died and they're essentially bringing a body onto the aircraft, nothing I can say is ever going to make that go away. You know, that's, and it's almost like some of them just didn't even display emotion because I think they were just emotionless at that point, almost in shock and all just dry of emotion. You know, it just leaked out of them at that point. So, so that was really tough. But the other side of the mark was the sitting around. You know, if you're on that duty for a week at a time, like you mentioned the Raf Reg guy, you never really relax. You don't go to the, you can't go to the gym. You know, you're bundled to the tent. You eat together, sleep together. You know, you're all in the same tent. Even when you every time that phone rings, your adrenaline spikes through your body. So it's really even if you never do one shout in a week, the fact that you're on that standby for so long is still quite detrimental to your health because it's that heightened sense of response all the time. So eventually, from about oh nine onwards. They reduced the duty to 24 on, 24 off for us because it was, they assessed for that point, it was so detrimental on our mental health. But the truth is, a lot of people's damage had been done by then. You know, guys had seen some horrific things. You know, you'd be getting body bags on and you'd be trying to count the casualties on the, on the ramp or on the, the, the floor of the aircraft. And you'd be expecting like, you know, three casualties and you'd see two casualties in like a, you know, a body bag. And that was the third casualty, but it was half full. You know, that's the kind of stuff you were seeing. 
you know, just uh, my last shout, we picked up an American who'd been killed and he got brought back over the aircraft ramp with the Stars and Stripes flag over the body. And then they handed me his foot in a clear plastic bag. And it was just so normal at the time. You know, I was just like, oh, here's his foot. And I think that, again, coming back to the normality bar, your my normality bar for what trauma was had gone completely out of whack by that point. I was like, oh, here we go. Just some, some guy's foot that I've got in my hand. You know, it was just, it was so, I was so emotionless, so zoned out of it by then. So but looking back in hindsight, it's probably pretty pretty detrimental for your mental health and you leave the forces. But you would never have made it through if you hadn't have had that response. You, know, you just had to look at it as a job. Yeah, it's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like uh, if you look, <clears throat> if you looked at it and thought, "Oh, what's the best way to deal with uh, these kind of situations, which is good for my long-term mental health?" <laughs> well, the way to probably not the suggested way to do it, it yeah, not be there, <laughs> but the suggested way to deal with it probably not be very conducive to surviving in, in that moment. Yeah, you know, or or surviving that moment and being able to carry on with the mission the next hour, the next day, the next, yeah. the next week, you know. Uh, and so I never personalized it. You know, all the Merc guy, all the, you know, casualties we picked up who had already died or who died in the back of the aircraft. So to me, they were just the most in, important piece of freight that I would ever carry back to Bastion. It was a real honor to be part of their last journey off the battlefield. I've always said that, you know, Merc was the highs and the lows of my career, but it was a privilege, an absolute privilege to be part of it. Um, but I never wanted to know the back catalogue of those soldiers because it, it once you start to personalise it, it really starts to hit you. So uh, most of the Chinook fleet, I think, sort of felt like that. You know, it's just a real, you know, it's a really important piece of freight, but don't overthink it. And then I did many years later. <laughs> mm, I think, yeah, I think you're right, though. The, le the less you know, you know, the less you know about uh, about someone who's died, the better. It's like the, yeah. the, the deaths have most impacted me. Strangely, have been since there have been people I work with during my time in the military have died since, yeah, and it fucking destroys me. Like it, every single one that's happened, and it'll keep happening as you get older. People die, right, for whatever reason. It's yeah. worse when it's someone they die before the time, uh, in whatever circumstance, and it just seems to impact me more now. But it's because it's because I know more about, I know them, I know yeah. things about them, and yeah. I know, like, and I know, especially now if they've died and stuff's gone on in the past. I know they've been on things like Afghanistan or yeah. Iraq or, or but they've just been a really fucking good soldier or yeah. sailor or airman or woman, you know, and uh, and then they and then they end up disappearing. You go, fucking hell, man. Yeah, one of my Destroys best mates, she died with cancer um, at the tail end of 2017 and she was a great crewman, absolutely, you know, just really cut the cloth as a crew girl. She was brilliant, you know, had dodged bullets with me in Afghanistan and, and actually won a Millie Award. Remember the Sun Millie Awards? She won Airman of the Year one time for bravery. Uh, she was a great girl. And yeah, she got cancer stage four and, and died a, a year and a half later. And you just think, fucking hell, she's dodged everything else and then cancer got her. So, and like you said, it was really hard to, for me to process that because it was like, it just felt really unfair. And I think... If you're in the forces and you get taken out by a bullet or if you're a helicopter crewman, you die in a helicopter crash, in a weird way, at least you're dying kind of doing what you, I'm not going to say loved because that's probably the wrong term, but you, you die doing the thing you joined up to do. You don't expect to be taken by something that's completely out of your hands. So yeah, it's quite hard to deal with. Mm. You uh, you mentioned off air and I think you said you, you're all right talking about it is um, not long ago. You decided to take an overdose because you didn't want to be here anymore. Yeah. That makes me well up thinking about oh. it. Jesus. Oh, my God. <laughs> got, an, got an issue, <laughs> did, issue. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah, nowhere. So, uh, but do you, do you, in, in, obviously, you're on the back end of that coming out. Yeah. Swinging, yeah. right? Um, Swinging is probably a bad term to use when <laughs> talking about <laughs> overdoses. Leading up to that, not leading up to that, in processing that, do you, do you, is there any particular incident you you attribute that uh, mental health decline to that point to, or 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 not? Yeah, I do. Yeah, absolutely. When oh, I okay. look back now, I so I was med boarded out of the RAF in 2019. I developed a neck injury mostly because I'd like flown in Chinooks for 17 years. My neck was in bits, and um, I'd done classic like physio rehab, Aldershot, Headley Court. Just nobody could fix it, and it essentially had damaged two vertebrae in my neck. So I got med boarded out. But life in 2019 was really good. You know, you leave the forces and I think it's almost like you've been let loose into the real world and you're like, woohoo, on a real high for a year, living my best life, going to every single festival and party and just, it was great. And um, and throughout my time in the forces, all the trauma that I'd seen, I dealt with by, I think we all do this, is like you go to the gym, keep busy at the gym, keep busy just generally in life, you know, almost bury your head in the sand a bit and go out with your mates. You know, we that's how we decompress, isn't it? 
And in 2020, then we got locked down by Boris in March. Now, over the space of that, like three years running up to that, I'd been red boarded out of the RAF. I'd gone through quite a messy divorce in the end. Um, and my partner was um, in the army as well. So we both come from quite a pointed career in the forces to both being kind of on the scrap heap pretty quickly. Um, and then I'd lost my mate to cancer. So it was like a domino effect. And um, but again, I thought I was dealing with it really well. 2020 got locked down. And as that year progressed, because um, I lived on my own at this point, I had all my coping mechanisms were gone. So no big long runs because we were only allowed 20 minutes a day walking. We still weren't allowed to bubble at that point. So it was just me on my own. And like the old biddy around the co-op for, for a bit of chat every couple of days. Um, and none of those coping mechanisms anymore. And suddenly I find myself with just my own thoughts and lots of spare time. And I lost my routine. And I think when you lose your routine, especially for a forces person, that's what we thrive on, isn't it? Purpose and routine. And I had neither of those during lockdown. I don't think many people did. So as the year went on, I developed insomnia. And what, like one of the nights when I wasn't able to sleep, I started to look up the back catalogue of some of the soldiers that I had picked up on Mert. So finding out the names of them, Googling them, some of them were engaged, some of them had kids. And suddenly those people, that important package, that precious freight was not a person with a backstory. And it really started to have a detrimental effect on me. And instead of telling anyone, which would have been a good thing to do, if anyone's listening to this, tell someone if you notice these things, but, you know, combat indicators. No, I just thought, well, everyone's going through something in lockdown. You know, it's not, you know, I don't want to bother anyone. And I think... You know, coming back to the thing about being a female in the forces, I never felt, you know, I never felt like the weaker sex. I was never ever made to feel like it would be a burden. But I think internally, I never wanted to be that burden, which is why I kind of really, you know, I was on top of my fitness. I really, you know, was good. Well, I tried to be as best at my job as I could be. So I was never a burden. And it was the same feeling. I didn't want to burden anyone with the crap I was going through. And then in August 2020, I woke up one day and was just like a being body snatched by the Grim Reaper. Essentially, when... Yeah, today's the day. I just want all the noise to end. And it wasn't like voices in my head. Or, and I wasn't having flashbacks or anything like that. My brain was just so busy. And I just wanted the noise to go away. I wanted to go to sleep forever. So I took a huge overdose that night at midnight. And throughout that day, I spent all day planning it, you know, with meticulous precision, like I was on a deliberate off at work. So I plan, like I Googled. And the scary thing is there's websites out there where you can Google how to kill yourself, which is really scary. And I, I figured out how many pills I'd need to kill myself outright. Um, I, um, or put myself in a 50-50 bracket. And I had a repeat prescription for a drug called amitriptyline at the time, which I was taking for my neck pain. Um, and actually that morning I did phone the GP and said, look, I'm having these, you know, suicidal thoughts. This is totally not me at all. I'm a really bubbly person normally. And instead of saying, like, are you taking any other medication or do you want to come in and chat to someone? They prescribed me some antidepressants. Uh, who did you ring, sorry? The GP. Oh, the, the doctor. GP. Oh, yeah. Right. So um, <coughs> I was like, well, actually, no one cares now. You know, I've reached out for help and all he's done is issue me more pills on top of the pills that I've already got coming. So that afternoon, I went across the GP surgery, which was opposite my house, picked up a lethal dose of drugs, two bags of drugs. After you told them you're thinking about committing suicide. Yeah. Yeah, paid for them, had to pay for my prescription at the time. So £13, contactless later. And I was, this is how emotionally removed I was from myself and that none of this struck an emotion. So got my drugs, went back home, had dinner, um, wrote my suicide note, you know, to my family, my friends. And to me, suicide had always been the most selfish thing someone can do. Abs you know, I've, I've heard of people, I'd never up until that point known anyone had taken their own life, but I was like, it's a, a coward's way out, it's selfish, it leaves all those questions behind, a wake of questions. And and there was me writing my own suicide note, not even with a tear in my eye. And um, I then tidied the apartment, I had a shower, got dressed, did my hair and makeup. Every, like, it was just such a weird day, it was like watching my life through a movie. And at midnight, sat on the edge of the bed and took 95 amitriptyline and don't remember much after that. I think I um, heard someone on the phone saying, stay awake, don't go to sleep. But I don't know if that's me trying to fill in the gaps. You know, like on a shit night out when you drunk too much and you wake up the next day and you're like, did they actually say that? I'm not sure. And the next thing I woke up and it was three, it was two days later and I woke up and I had a tube down my throat, it was incubated. So I had a tube down my throat and there was faces everywhere above me, doctors. And um, they were saying my name, saying Elizabeth, Elizabeth. And my overwhelming emotion as soon as I came to was I'm drowning because I couldn't breathe because of this tube. And I just kept trying to grab it. 
and I didn't want to die. I started crying, but I couldn't speak because of this tube and my overwhelming emotion, my whole body just didn't want to die. And it's so weird looking back now that literally 48 hours before, that is all I'd wanted to do with no emotion. And I think, you know, if anyone listening to this, if they ever are going through those kind of thoughts, your brain can play tricks on you really badly. And it had done that day. So what essentially had happened, I was still there, you know, in the hospital. Uh, they put me back to sleep and then they brought me back around again and took the tube out eventually. Um, and I still had no idea how I'd got there, who'd found me, how I'd survived. And it was only on leaving. I sort of started to get little bits of information from the doctor saying I'd been brought in by an ambulance. Um, I've been very lucky that they said if it had been in any later than I had have been brought in, I probably wouldn't have made it. I actually spoke to the ambulance crew about two weeks later to thank them. And they said, yeah, if you hadn't lived opposite the hospital, you probably would have made it. And I'd been on life support for two days. But um, I eventually got out four days later and got reunited with my phone. So me and my best friend went through my phone and I'd called the Samaritans for 13 seconds at 10 to 1. Don't remember that phone call. In the afternoon? No, that night. Yeah. So I took the overdose at midnight and I'd called the Samaritans at 10 to 1 which I don't remember. And then I'd called 911. So I don't know why you're not 999. I must have been watching too much Netflix or something <laughs> during lockdown. But um, so I think it must have been the ambulance. That must have been me phoning the ambulance. And then obviously they, they came to, to get me to the hospital, but um, none of it I remember. So very lucky girl. Um, and I think, you know, I came out of hospital, say the four days later, was handed a poly pocket with some leaflets about, you know, mental health and stuff like that with the um, veterans gateway circled, said phone these people because you're a veteran. So I did. And thankfully, combat stress took over and then they put me in touch with all the counselors and whatnot. But those initial few days after leaving hospital, I felt so euphoric. I was like, well, that's it then. You know, it's the worst it's ever going to get, you know, hit rock bottom. Everywhere is up from here. And I was so wrong. I mean, that was the lid essentially had come off and all the files had gone everywhere in my brain. Um, but the real journey was then putting those all back in the right place. So throughout my counselling, I, I kind of the first counsellor I had, I really didn't get on with. I, and that wasn't her fault. But I, lo I, uh, I went down to my first counselling session and she had a headscarf on and loads of bangles and stuff. And I thought, she's not going to understand what I'm talking about. And she didn't. You know, she was a really lovely lady, but not the right fit for me. Um, and then I got another counsellor and she was really good. She was from Help for Heroes. But again, to give anyone listening to this advice, it's like, you know, counsellors are like shoes. You know, if they don't fit right, change it sooner or later. Don't just suffer through with it because you think you should be getting better. You know, change it up quickly and get someone that you do click with because it's all about personalities. Um, but anyway, my second counsellor kind of took me through a lot of the stuff. And, and I think the important thing was that I didn't just scoop everything up and put it back in my brain and lock it away again. I read all the files and kind of acknowledged the trauma that I'd seen over the years and, and Mert and Anna dying and, you know, the divorce and stuff, because that in itself does take its toll on you, even though you pretend you're OK. So I read all those files, acknowledged the trauma and then filed them back away. So throughout that time, you know, it was a really tough journey for two years. And on this time, even a year ago, I think if someone had said, how are you doing? I would be like, yeah, I'm OK. And it took someone to you know, go, are you sure you're OK? And that ask twice thing. And that's another message I keep saying to people is always ask someone twice. Because generally when people said to me the second time, are you OK? I'd be like, well, actually, I'm still not great. And you, it would crack the egg a little bit enough just to kind of let the emotion out. But, um, but yeah, suicide itself that day, you know, I was in a tunnel. I was, I'd, it's like a water slide. I'd got my donut. I was going one way that day and nobody could have stopped me. Even if Brad Pitt had come around for dinner, I still was doing what I was doing. And that's another message I try as a survivor to tell people that, you know, we've all lost people to suicide, I think, in the forces, especially Herrick veterans. I think a lot of, I mean, the statistics are scary for the amount of people that we've lost post Herrick to suicide. And there's so many questions that do come out the back of that. But actually having been in that tunnel now, there is very little you could have ever done to stop someone once they have mentally checked into that point until you, if you can catch it early enough. But once they're in that departure lounge, it is really hard to intervene to stop them because they're almost like mindset task focused. Yeah, I think the first point of uh, the first point of help is like the individual having the knowledge to know that to, to be able to identify when they're going towards that point. Yeah, uh, which is kind of which is. Yeah, you know, I'd guess that you can see uh, a decline yourself way, way in advance of what you could used to. You made a really good point about um, your brain will play tricks on you. Yeah, I've, I've, I've like said kind of the same thing before. 
speaking from my own experience and it's like when your when your mental health gets to a certain point in decline you get to it gets to a certain point it's like a, a threshold it crosses which is different for everyone and it's different depending on the circumstance and why your mental health decline and why you are where you are and, and also what like substance abuse is going on and things like that and, and the way your life is but it'll get below a certain certain threshold and it's and it to reinforce it saying it fucking lies to you oh, big it time. lies to you you uh, you you start perceiving the world and perceiving events and uh, and start perceiving events in a way that is not it, it's not the correct perception, you know. Uh, like so, like people can get anxious over uh, someone said something and then all day they'll be thinking about did I say the right thing? Did I say the wrong yeah. thing? And that's if they're still being social, you know. It's uh, or if you're in a situation. Where, well, the classic is as you got to a point. N- there's nothing out there that can help me. There's no way help. I'm a lost fucking cause. Yeah. And that and that is never the case exactly it's never the case I mean I got ever 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 whenever I came out the other side of it I had so many most of my friends were angry really angry at me for what I'd done and they were like why didn't you fucking reach out for help Liz and the truth is because I just didn't want to burden anyone and I thought I was a lost cause and you're right it was you know so many people are like Liz of course we would have been there for you but your brain really thinks oh everyone's busy everyone's doing this everyone's doing that and you your brain really fucks you over. So yeah, exactly that. And that's just friends, right? Yeah. I mean, on the other, when I think when I think back to my own experiences, it's like knowing what I know now. If I was if I was then, and maybe a few weeks before one of the particular times, I would have never got to that point. Yeah. Because I know there's a million different organisations. There's a million different people. Fucking hell, I could walk into the. Lo- I could go and knock on any door on the street and go and say, "Excuse me." I am not well. Yeah. I am not well. Can I just come and sit down for 10 minutes? I mean, that's ex- in extreme. But my point is, it's yeah. all there. But my brain, what your brain was doing is saying, n- there's yeah. no way out. Yeah. It, well, there is a way out. It's only one way out. And that's it means it. you're not around anymore. Yeah. And it's going to be nice. It's going to be great. Yeah. And you're all going to be fine. And the thing is, I think, did you experience, when you made that decision, so I've never got the point of view did we're actually following through on, 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 uh, on like trying to commit suicide. Okay. Yeah. When you made the decision, did it bring a, around like an element of, tranquility and peace and we, was that was that day quite relaxed yes <laughs> I, it, I thought I've heard it before from other seriously, people seriously really weirdly yeah I say I am um, and even when the point because I think the lack of emotion was quite apparent all day and I had been on this drug amitriptyline which is attributable to 60% of suicides in America oh it's a God. nasty drug and it's a drug that a lot of amputees are on because it's a nerve blocker oh my God. and it's part of a nerve blocker and blocks your emotions so that, I reckon that was probably a part to play in it did you know that before you started taking it? No. Oh my god. And funny enough, when in the deep when I phoned the GP that morning, at no point did he ask me, did he say, Are you taking any other medication? Or look at my notes to see that I'd reordered Amitriptyline on the Monday. And it's a really nasty drug. Um, but it had blocked all the emotions. But even when I'd taken the 95th pill and I knew that I was more than likely gonna die, I still didn't cry. Nothing. No emotion, nothing at all. And and I mean, don't go wrong, I love a drink, but I've never drunk on my own. I've always been a social drinker. Like, I mean, invite me to the opening of an envelope and I'm there wanting a bottle of Prosecco. But I never drink on my own, which is probably a good thing during lockdown, especially considering where I was going and, and mental health wise. But I think if I'd have washed it all down with some alcohol, it probably would have been the end of me. Um, but yeah, it was that, it was really tranquil. It was very, you know, a very serene day, despite nothing felt frantic about it. It was like, I've actually, that burden's been lifted off my shoulders. Now I've made my decision. Um, my best friend's a civvy and she's a training to be a psychologist or a counsellor and I, she texted me the day before and she knew I'd been having ups and downs during lockdown and, and you know I had been starting to kind of overthink things and she messaged me nearly every day to check in on me and she messaged me the night before and said how are you doing today and I said I'm really good thank you I've got a plan and she never picked up on it and she said in hindsight now looking back if you hear those words from someone I've got a plan it's usually a massive combat indicator love that word um but you know towards someone who's in that kind of headspace and I think the other thing that for us looking at our mates is that it's that change of behavior none of my friends picked up on it because we were in lockdown so they weren't seeing me but before lockdown I did like Ironman triathlons I'd run every day I'd be out cycling and doing loads of activity and stuff and during lockdown all of that stopped and as I started to get worse and worse you know I'd get up in the morning I'd get into my Lycra, get my cycling shoes on, look at my bike, and then I'd be like, nah, not today, brain. It's not happening. Back into bed, still in bed at three o'clock in the afternoon. And, you know, people would be like, oh, how are you doing? I'd be like, yeah, just back in from a cycle. You know, can you just lie because you didn't see anyone and because you were on your own? And 
you know, again, all of we are the best looking after our mates because we all we've all served together. We all know each other's behaviors really well, especially from my like Chinook crew mates. You know, we lived you know breathe together for months on end so at the end of Mert you could really pick up on someone's behaviours if it was someone who was a gym bunny who suddenly never went to the gym anymore like I was doing or someone who used to be always done the pub and then suddenly didn't want to go to the pub or vice versa someone who didn't really drink start drinking you can pick up those shifts in behaviour and that's when on the really early days of someone starting to struggle that's how you know you can really watch for that in your mates I was unlucky that mine was timed nicely with lockdown and no one was there to pick up on those sh massive shifts in personality. So I think that's where I really fell through a couple of hoops and kind of ended up in the worst hole ever. But, mm. you know, anyone listening, that's what you've got to watch out for you, mates, really, is that seismic shift in behaviour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's a bit... Uh, uh, in fact, now, before I come on to that, describe the noise to me. You were talking... You were talking about that morning. You woke up. You wanted the noise to go away, and you yeah. probably, had, I'm assuming, you had it for at least a few, at least a few days. Describe the noise to me. So I wrote a po I used to write loads of poetry whenever I was going through um, lockdown and um, and the PTSD counselling as well. And I wrote a poem called "The Marble," and it kind of summed it up. It felt like every time I sat still, a mar or put my head on a pillow, like there was a marble ro like rolling around in my brain, just hitting the walls and bouncing off everything. And it was, it was those thoughts, it was the chatter and it would be like overthinking all sorts of stuff. I remember one night trying to get sleep and thinking about the M60 stoppage drills, which is just so bizarre. Why do I ever need to think about those again? I'd been out of the raft for a year and a half at this point and I'm going through them and going, no, that's not right. And going back through them thinking, why do you even need to remember this? You know, it's just that, you know, and, and then going through other drills at work and trying to remember people's names and just really random thoughts. But they just kept punching into my brain and I couldn't get rid of them. You know, I remember people talking about mindfulness where you sit and you get let, let your thoughts come into your head and let them leave like a tree and leaving a platform. I tried all that. None of it was working. It was like it was trapped in there. and It was just bouncing around, you know, and it wasn't anything specific in terms of, you know, thinking about one particular merch shout. It was just all the crap that had built up over 17 years just bouncing around. Really, really bizarre. Yeah, like a pinball. My cousin, yeah. wrote, my cousin wrote a book called, um, he'd be on the podcast soon, but he wrote a book. Uh, he, he grew up in a real, real bad childhood trauma for for, for various reasons. And uh, it is the book, the title, it's a poetry book, right? Yeah. Uh, and the title of the book is House of Bees. And um, when oh, he used that phrase, yeah. I thought, yes, because I, I, when I asked you to describe noise, I want to hear what you say, because I, yeah. I, I know exactly what, I know exactly what you mean. And, um, and it is, like you said, I, I would say pinball. I would think of it as yeah, pinball. Yeah, pinball marble was Bouncing mine. Yeah, just oh, well, if I can think about this now, think about that, think about that. And you can you cannot tie it down. Nope. You cannot tie it down and think about anything for more than a split second. You may come back to the same recurring thought for for a period over a period of time, but yeah. it's not something you can focus on. And and, and same with that, that house of bees analogy, I think is really similar as well. It's really difficult to describe. Yeah. It's really difficult to describe. And, and it'd one, be different if you had is, something to worry about. You know, I can understand if you had like a job interview coming up or you had a big project at work and you were lying awake at night thinking about that and if there was a common thread you would almost be able to process that wouldn't you but it was like you say it's not there was no specificness to it it was just noise and random thoughts and none of them had a thread or a theme and none of them had a reason or a purpose it was just there couldn't get out i think that's partly where the uh, part is well where the the, 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 la the like the lack of emotional response comes from um because you can't you can't you can't spend you can't spend enough time on a particular thought to consider how you should or shouldn't feel about it yeah. either consciously or subconsciously i think because yeah. you just you, i became in, incapable of decision making for a long time I, incapable of decision making because i didn't want to make the wrong decision even over the most innocuous things yeah the most the most irrelevant things i didn't want to make a decision because something in my, in my mind said not that i think anything in my past i've made a wrong decision on anything in military yeah. wise anyway i've certainly i've certainly made wrong decisions but i don't don't think to the point like it would catastrophically cause me to not want to make decisions but yeah it'd be things like you know like a, a bill would come in yeah and oh i need to pay that bill i wouldn't want to make the decision to pay the bill really yeah because oh what if i run out of money yeah but it was i wouldn't decide well obviously that's the bad answer pay the fucking bill it's like catastrophic it, thinking as well i mean yeah. all that kind of indecision leads to that cat catastrophizing thinking as well you know what the worst can happen and you th always look for the worst thing and i really suffered badly whenever i left the forces from imposter <coughs> syndrome as well you know i remember thinking at some point someone's going to so catch me out do. Yeah. so many people and it's only now that i start talking about this a lot and i talked about it in the book a bit you know um so many people come back and say that as well and even now you know i go into I'm a project manager now, uh, as we spoke about before. And I still think 
do I really know what the fuck I'm doing? And every day I think someone's going to find out that I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you kind of just like, it's like, I feel like I've cuffed everything in life. I've managed to not be found out and managed to cuff everything. And actually, you know, when it's only when I think I put it on paper and I talk to more people about it, that you realise that actually you know, at some point you, you were good at your job and you were earning your salts. But it's really hard when you're in amongst loads of other people doing the same thing. Because I, ne- I still don't think what I did was anything special. You know, yes, I've written a book and... I've been very clear about the fact that I never want any extra praise for being a female doing my job because there was loads of us. Well, not loads, but there was five. Seems like loads. But, um, you know, everyone was doing the same thing. You know, although I did 10 Herricks, a lot of crewmen, a lot of Chinook crews have done 10 Herricks, you know, and yeah, we've dodged bullets, but so have you guys. And when you're in that bunch of people who have all been through the same experience, you, you're not anything special. And you don't, we, none of the forces that went through that war, we're, it's like we're all in our own secret club, isn't it? You start talking about Bob's and you start talking about, you know, Inkerman and Kajaki and all those names and everyone kind of, like you're in this little gang together, but none of us give ourselves a pat on the back for what we went through because we all kind of almost write off and go, yeah, we were all in the same boat. Yeah, we were all in the same boat, but we weren't all, you know, it was a different ocean compared to what civvies were in. You know, it was really, it was a really weird era. It was, a, you know, it was, it's a, I always, I wrote a blog recently and I said, because I had a, a debate with a woman, Sheila Hancock, who's like a really famous English actress who does loads of Shakespeare and stuff. She was at um, a book festival I did and she's a pacifist. She's a Quaker. So I was like, oh, this is not going to be good. But I was suffering from impost- imposter syndrome that day. I was at this book festival in Yeovil and I thought, and all these writers were there and they kept going, so you're a writer? And I was like, I'm not a writer, I'm a Chinook crewman. And I was thinking, fuck, you're not a Chinook crewman anymore, Liz, like you left two years ago, but I couldn't figure out what the fuck I was. <laughs> and anyway, she came in and she started debating about Afghanistan and said, you know, I don't believe in wars and I don't think we achieved anything in Afghanistan, which I had my own piece to say about, you know, that I think we actually did. I think, yeah, if we washed all down the river and said we didn't achieve anything, that would be really detrimental. You know, we, we did achieve something. We got some people out. We got some people a voice and that was enough. But I also said, to her, like the thing about war and about loss and it's something that I experienced with Mert is once you've seen loss and you've seen someone watch their best mate die at their feet, that teaches you how to love because you can't really experience true love until you've experienced true loss, I think. And you've got a passion for something and you've seen that on both sides. And she kind of just stopped in her tracks at that and kind of thought, have I won? Have I won against Sheila Hancock? But it's so true. You know, I think the the loss that we all experienced in that war has probably made us all better coming out the back the back of it. And yes, it's left its mark on a lot of us and it's left a bit of a, you know, there's certainly a lot of people out there who are suffering from it. But I think we all think a bit more because of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know what you, I know what you, I know what you mean. I think I do think that um, that that period of time, sort of the sweet spot, yeah. the sweet spot, the sweet spot of operations for military, for for British military was you know two thousand and one, two thousand and two through to two thousand and what? When did we come out of Afghanistan? Fifteen. Yeah, I was on the last Chinook that left without a bastion, which is really weird. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I think that one of the indirect effects of it positive effects not that i'm saying this this not like i'm saying this validates everything we ever we have ever done on, on on those kind of operations but one of the things that does happen is it is a it brings society in general up a level yeah we just as in, so i think the british people in general military or not military ex-military or, or, or serving or not i think it just brings us up a notch in terms of our resilience our connection to one another our empathy, our sense of community, our sense of uh, collective purpose. Yeah. You know, I think it does bring it up, unfortunately. And, and, and in, in the only way that can be done, and I think through through things like extreme hardship that war brings about. Yeah. You know, uh, and it does do that. You're still right. right. I did the first poppy appeal day. Do you remember the poppy collection they do in London every year? I was on the very first one of those. And like this has gone back years and years ago. And... um and the, we were in, we were stationed at Bank. We were at Bank Underground, and obviously the nature of where that was in the country, you know, all the bankers coming out at lunchtime. We were getting like twenty, forty pounds shoved in the pots for the poppy appeal. You know, didn't even want a poppy, just wanted to thank us for a service. And the overwhelming response we got for that that day was amazing. And obviously, then you saw the repatriation ceremonies and how the British public got behind those. And then. We pulled out of Afghan and it felt like kind of that had really waned. I thought, well, the British public are so fickle. You know, they were really supportive when they see bodies coming back in coffins draped in a Union Jack flag. And now they just don't really care anymore. And, and that thank you for your service, you know, was kind of gone. 
And you look, I mean, it's the same with COVID. You know, we all clap for the NHS and then suddenly no one really gives a fuck anymore. But whenever, I, last year, I marched at the Cenotaph and uh, I marched with the Mert Club. It was a, they actually spun up two years ago was the first year that they were marching and I'd been invited to go along and it's always been a bucket list of mine. Um, and four days before I had a huge PTS meltdown. I saw the, because four days before was actually Remembrance Day and did the minute silence at home and was watching it. And the words, the glorious dead on the side of the cenotaph leap off the side of the cenotaph at me. And it just, because I've seen, you know, we've seen death. There's nothing glorious about death. And the very fact that those words were written on the side of the cenotaph just used to, it just really, un, un, rile, like, unstuck me. And I went straight back into a spiral of, you know, didn't leave the house for five days, cancelled going to the cenotaph. And after all the stuff that has to go in behind that, the scenes to get you there and the security clearances, I was gutted that I didn't go. And Charlie, who was organising it for me, one of the Mert medics, said seven people had pulled out for the same reason. Couldn't go, just couldn't face it. Anyway, I then went this year and my name had been put forward to um, to be interviewed by the BBC. So, and it did an interview with Sophie Rayworth, which I was fine for. And then joined the Mert gang and marched past the Cenotaph and looked up just to see the glorious dead words and just came undone again. So I ended up essentially crying like tiny tears as I marched past the cenotaph and BBC News caught up right on camera. That's how I ended up getting in touch with you. Oh, is it? That is, well, I, yeah, that's what it came about. Uh, I saw I saw that. It didn't look like you crying tiny tears. It looked like you were fucking fighting it oh, back. Oh, fuck like, me. It was hard. Oh, my yeah. God. Well, I thought, Jesus Christ, fair fair play. Oh, you want to see fair me when play. I go back to horse guards? <laughs> 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 it all came. But, but anyway, so I, I, it, yeah, I was holding it. I really was holding it. And I, I mean, that bottom lip was giving it beans on the way past there. <laughs> But that was the emotion just spilling over. Oh, yeah. And I got back to Horse Guards and switched my phone on. And I had, no joke, about 200 messages from complete strangers that day, thanking me for my service, thanking the British forces for what they did, thanking Mert for what they did. You know, mums and dads of guys we brought back thanking me. One woman left me a lovely message saying, Liz, you don't know me. I've just seen you in BBC, but my husband and my son are at the parade. If you need a hug, here's their number. And it was just this overwhelming outpour and coming back to your point about the British public you know I sold them down the river and thought they're just such a fickle bunch and they're not it's still there it's just not vocalised but they still absolutely support the forces and they remember what we did and um, and that was a really heartwarming kind of day to have that so yeah my phone didn't stop for about three or four days after that mm. people kept sending me screenshots <laughs> <laughs> of me like trying to hold myself together I was like oh, yeah, can you stop doing that please yeah. but yeah yeah the glorious dead is a weird phrase I know what you mean yeah. I, I, like, I, think I mean I know it's a religious thing but you know what about you know the glorious unforgotten or something but just the glorious dead doesn't sit well with me I, I think it worked years ago when they met the cenotaph in a different time but not now but I mean you know the, it's the cenotaph yeah um, I, I, I'm a bit like you I, I I think a lot of the people these days. I mean, it used to be frowned upon not to go to, not to go to the remembrance services and that. But to be honest, I have to wait and see how I'm feeling. Yeah, I do sometimes. So, sometimes I want to go. Sometimes, most of the time, I don't want to go these days. If I do go, most of the time, I don't really wear any medals or bury or anything. Isn't it weird that we're like that though? Because that's what I talked about in my interview with Sophie. Was that the year before I couldn't even leave the house and I was like a prisoner in my own house. And I felt like I was letting the side down because I wasn't going to a service and because I didn't want to go out. And um, and I said, I'm sure there's loads of people watching this today who are in exactly the same boat. And that's a lot of the messages I got where people saying, Liz, I have that every year. It's like I'm just bungeed to the house and can't go mm. out. And other people saying the same as you, you know, I go out, but I stand at the back of the parade incognito. And I think, fuck, it's the one day of the year where we're, should be, you know, we're allowed to be celebrated and people are allowed to you know, thank us. Yet we all want to just blend into the background. I don't see it as being that. You not? No, I see it as being and going and paying respects to the dead, mm -hmm. uh, or 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 a a mo a forced not a forced moment a moment where you should dedicate that to thinking about the people who aren't you anymore. So that's why I see it. Yeah, no, I never I get thought that. as a, I've never seen it as a thank you to us, and I and probably one of the reasons I don't like going a lot of the time now is because I I don't want to feel. Like, so like feel, you're stealing their valor almost. Or, yeah. No, feel, feel special. Yeah. I don't want you. I don't want you. I'm just talking from my perspective and like, and it's as irrational as sometimes it sounds. I don't want your fucking thanks. Yeah. You know, it's almost like a bit like the imposter syndrome. I don't want your thanks. No. Yeah. Like I'm your, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm your I'm just back. trying to think about the way I think about it. Yeah. So and I, do you know what? Like. I think up until this year, I always felt like very much like that. But walking with the Mert, I was almost really proud to go of what we did as well. Mm. You know, in that kind of, and the thing about the Chinook Force specifically was that, 
I never saw my best mate get blown up. I never saw my son or, you know, my dad or anyone close to me get blown up. But I saw the collective loss of that entire war. You know, we picked up nearly every soldier that, you know, got blown up. We saw the uh, the Afghan people. You know, we picked up so many Afghan locals, you know, kids and, you know, families and whatnot who'd been caught in the crossfire. We actually had one shot where we had to go and pick up a Taliban. There'd been troops in contact. It was our British soldiers. There was three of our guys injured, I think, or maybe two. And a Taliban coming over the ramp on a stretcher. I was like, what the fuck? Like, how has our moral compass got so skewed that we're picking up a fucking Taliban now? But actually, you know, there's a reason behind that. They had to get him back to Bastion. And, um, you know, but it was that collective loss, I think, that really stayed with a lot of the Mert gang. And I think, you know, on Remembrance Sunday, I was really feeling that kind of loss that we all felt together as well, rather than remembering anyone an individual. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But I do know what you mean. You just, it's not like you ever want thanks. You just kind of, yeah, you just want to, yeah, I think, I, be proud of what you've done as well, but silently. Yeah. I, yeah, I didn't mean to say, no, no I get it. No, I should do it. No, I like, I'm just the point was I'm trying to rationalize why sometimes I don't feel like doing it. No, absolutely. But even an Armed Forces Day, I mean, how many people, I never make a big deal of Armed Forces Day. I don't know if it's still even a thing, but, um, you know what? I'd never go out wanting thanks for it. And I think that's what most of us are like. I mean, I know that it'd be nicer if we were acknowledged a bit more. Like, you know, the way the American cheesiness of like getting clapped at Waterworld or whatever, and we all have to stand up because you're heroes and all that jazz. I that's know. a bit much. <laughs> I know, but you know what? I prefer it to be the way we are. Yeah. In that, in, in that I think, I think that the fact that it isn't like that in America. Yeah. It means that how like society retains some sort of individuality and it's not group think mentality yeah. because not everyone agrees with the military or, oh, yeah. or, or our like uh, our foreign policy whatever and I, I do like yeah, I would not want to be the, be the American I do so. although I do think it'd be nice I mean you can get in for example you can get in more places for free with a blue Peter badge than you can with a 1250 and I think you know it'd be so nice if at least if you had an ID or a veterans card you could get a free bus pass or a free travel on the train or something that was just a little silent nod from the government to say Thank you for your service. So here you go. You can get a free train ride for the rest of your life. Because the train's going from A to B. It doesn't really matter whether or not you or I are on it. But it'd be nice if we could get on it for free. <laughs> yeah. 50% off of Domino's. Oh, yeah. And, and Nando's. Although I did a classic blonde moment when there was two of us. And I said, do we both get? And they were like, no. And I was like, okay. I'm trying to do the math on it. 25% <laughs> off the bill. I was like, pay separately and we'll get more off. And they're like, no, Liz, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Goodness me. Um... How is the how is the book going? How, what's the rece reception of the book been like? Really, really good. So I wrote it during that time when I was going through my PTSD counselling, and um, much like the thoughts and the marble and ping pong ball we were talking about earlier, the um, pinball, it just had to come out. Whatever was in there had to come out on the paper. So it took me three weeks to write the book, um, and I never wrote it with the idea of being it published or anything like that. It was just it fell the words fell out literally onto the laptop. <coughs> And then um, I was chatting to a civvy friend where I walk one day and I sort of laughed and said, don't, don't, you know, don't laugh too much, but I think I've written a book and she meant send me it. So I emailed it to her and she meant, you've got to send this to some publishers. So I, I did, I scattergunned it out to a few publishers and Pen and Sword came back and said, we really want to publish it. So that's how I ended up hitting the streets, but it was never, ever designed for that. And when it came out in September, I have been overwhelmed with this response, really. Not only has it been selling really well, which is great, but it was never for me about the money, so it never even intended to be published. But the amount of messages I've had back from people saying that, you know, it's helped with their mental health or they've seen some signs in themselves that I was talking about and they've actually reached out for help and gone to speak to someone about the PTSD. I had one chap message that said that he'd come home the day before and had found his wife surrounded by boxes of pills and she was about to kill herself and he reached out to her told her some of the things that come out of my book and she's now gone to get help and you know those are the kind of things that make it worthwhile it's all those like little messages from people um and then on the plus side some people who just were on herrick who have read it who were like oh i was at such and such a place when you were like we were telling earlier and it's almost like being back in the club again it's just really nice to have those kind of messages that you know from old friends that you never actually got the chance to speak to in the back of a Chinook, but they passed you at some point on a ramp. So, um, and lots of stories about Chinooks blowing shit over, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like this one time when you blew me over and my burger went everywhere. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that sounds like bad men to me. But, um, but yeah, so it's been really nice. It's been the, it's not, like the response back has been the main positive, I think, out of it all. So yeah, yeah it's been good. 
No, it's good. It's important. I, I like. I've I've read the book and I thoroughly enjoyed it. One because um, I learned. I, I've learned a lot about Chinook life and Chinook the Chinook crew and the way Chinooks operated. Like just really really good. But also to your point, reading about things that, oh yeah, shit, like when we came on the podcast, shit, we were in the same place together yeah. at the same time, but probably on, uh, probably on your heli at some point, you yeah. know what I mean, it's just, it's just great, but onto the mental health side, like we, we were talking earlier about, I think we were talking, was it on the icebreaker, on who knew about how to, you know, what, what, how do you prevent someone getting to that, the position you were in? Yeah. And I think the first and foremost is, it's the more people that ha- that have knowledge or a, a better knowledge or understanding of how uh, mental ill health and what it looks like and how it can decline. Yeah. The more people have that, because someone who has got the knowledge is less likely to go to that level than someone who hasn't got the knowledge. Yeah. Someone who hasn't li- listened to this, for example, or someone who hasn't read your book, for example, or anyone else's about mental ill health is more likely to go down that down the path than someone who isn't. And that's, yeah. that's why I really think it is really important to communicate the experiences. Not because, uh, look at me, this is a position I was in, oh, poor me, which is, you know, that's not why you wrote the book. Yeah. That's not why we talk about these things. It's because, it's like, fucking hell, just listen to what we're saying. You yeah. have to be there and, and by also understanding it. You may never go there. You, you someone listen to this, may never be someone who's going to get to that position of ever being really, you know, properly mentally ill. Fucking great. But by understanding and listening to our experiences and reading your book and your experiences in there, yeah. you know how to help other people and spot it. And I've had so many people say, thank you for your honesty in the book and thank you for sharing your story. And for me, say a year ago, I couldn't have talked about it as easily as I can talk about it today to you, you know. Even just sometimes saying the word suicide or I tried to take my life it just used to, you know, I just couldn't bring the words out of my throat. It was just so hard to say. Why do you think that is? Embarrassment? I think so. I think almost embarrassment and people asking for an explanation of why, how, you know, and I even I didn't have the answers back then. I didn't know why. So how can I explain to someone else why? And I think not necessarily embarrassment, but judgment, because coming back to my earlier saying of like, I thought suicide was the most cowardly way out of life. You know, if you do that, you were just selfish. And I remember, you know, you know, to say that, that I tried to do that is I was worried about the judgment, I think, as well. But now that I have put it, you know, on the book and the book is on the shelves for the whole world to read. I think that it's so much easier for me to talk about now. But the more I'm talking about it, say the more open I'm being is I'm it's almost like it's a two-way street and more and more people are coming back to me going I I mean I've had no exaggeration probably 15 to 20 good friends and colleagues who I went through the Chinook force with um reached out to me since the book came out and gone Liz I had no idea but actually this happened to me or two years ago I found myself on a bridge or I tried to you know do this and those stories are out there it's just that people don't talk about them so you know if I can you know open that two-way street of conversation with people then, then that's a good thing, I guess. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Where can people find the book? So it's on uh, Pen and Sword of the Publishers. So you go straight to Pen and Sword, and they've got some signed copies. Or Amazon, uh, I've got it as well at the minute, which is good. Go to Amazon because then you can leave a nice review, and also then it bumps me up on the. On the I was number one <laughs> on Amazon, like um, Air Force biographies for the, like the last month or something, and I was like beating the red arrows and the Typhoon book and all these other fast jet wankers, and I was like, yes, fast, Kelly- <laughs> fast jet wankers. Yeah. Anna, isn't Mandy Hickson the fast jet wanker? Yeah, but she's. A good Did you one. call her a fast jet wanker to her face? Uh, no, not yet. But I'm sure there's plenty <laughs> of time for that. I think we're going to go out for a night out, and uh, honestly, watch out winchester because if mandy and i hit winchester <laughs> she's like six foot five or something so um is she but, that tall yeah she's really tall i thought it was height limit on uh on the fast jets no she's i mean she might not be six foot five clearly okay. but she's about okay. six foot <laughs> two she's really tall but she's just such a great girl yeah. so yeah you have to get her on at some point but um yeah i don't think the world would know what would hit it if mandy and i went out for a night out we probably need some bodyguards, I think. In fact, everybody else might need bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> and you are starting on, um, not starting on, you've started already. You're doing uh, speaking gigs, right? Yeah. So how yeah. do people get hold of you for that then? So I'm on um, I'm on Twitter now. I joined Twatter, as I call it, a couple of months ago. So I'm on Twitter as at Chinny Chick. So anyone can kind of follow me along there and drop me a DM. At Chinny Chick. At yeah. Chinny Chick. And then I'm also on Instagram as uh, Chinook Crew Chick, name of the book. Um, so anyone can just drop me a DM and I kind of pick it up from there really I'm also on LinkedIn just my my actual name Liz McConaughey nothing very exciting but I'm on LinkedIn but yeah I'm, I've got um, I'm struggling to keep up with all these different platforms I wake up in the morning now and the book came out in America last week came out on Monday last week in America and um, 
Dylan who manufactured the minigun is Dylan Arrow that make the minigun, which is on the front cover of the book, obviously. Um, very kindly give it a shout out and promoted it for oh, me. I saw that on your Instagram. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I woke up Tuesday and I had about oh, like two, three hundred messages from just like geeks who love guns in America. And the thing is, Americans love chicks with guns, don't they? So I had like lose any following from America. So we'll see how it does across the pond. It'll be interesting. I'm still waiting for Tom Cruise to call to make a, a film about it because I think that'd be, you know, it'd be like. Top Gun meets Black Hawk Down with a like a bit of <laughs> Private Benjamin stuck in the middle somewhere. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah, I need to get somebody to get it on Tom Cruise's radar and Ross Kemp's in the book as well. And I need someone to get it under his nose as well because I actually speak quite highly of him in the book. You know, um, Ross Kemp. I think he was he wasn't that well thought of initially in the by the forces people because we all thought he was trying to be the hard man, wasn't he? And um, I could never serve a day in his life, but you would swear he'd like saved saved Helmand. But actually, looking back in retrospect, the stuff he now does with the Legion and the documentaries that he made, like the British public wouldn't know what we did in Helmand had it not been for Ross Kemp, I think. You know, a lot of the stuff, a lot of those hard man documentaries, he actually did show what we were doing and what we were up against. Um, so, yeah, he has got a place, I think. You know his backstory in EastEnders is that he's Paris. Oh, no, is it? Yeah, he's got a, <laughs> in the uh, early on, in early on when he started on the show, he's got a power edge tattoo. Oh no! Yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. Well, I need to. Yeah, yeah. I need to meet him at some point. And explain. I don't know yeah. if I'm a fan, Liz. I'll be honest. Are you I'm, not? I've never watched the program, so I can't watch any of the Afghan stuff. I Can you not? Eh, not really. Yeah, no, I can't do it. I don't. It comes back to like loose women. You Same just want to rip books. your arm off and throw it at the TV. You're <laughs> like, it wasn't like that. Well, people won't get the loose women reference because that was only ice cream. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have to you have to pay extra to come and listen to that. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. The flopper set. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Anything else? What have we not covered? I think we've covered it all. I think, you know, I'd love to tell anyone listening to this, what I now do with my mental health is I give it a number. So when people ask me, how are you doing? I now, you know, you say, I'm a, I'm a three today or I'm a seven. Because not only does it then give someone an indication that you're not quite 100%, but um, you don't necessarily have to explain why you're there. You just have to give them the number. But it's also good as like a leveler for yourself. If you are consistently saying the number three, that's not good. But if you just, because it's a shit day at January, you're trying to do January and the weather's wank and you're going, I'm a two today, that's probably fairly reasonable. So it's a good way, I think, for you to monitor your mental health when people ask you that, you know, give them a number instead of just going, yeah, I'm all right, living the dream, which is the classic answer we all give, isn't it? So actually be culpable for your own, you know, how you are, checking on yourself, because how is anyone else going to know you're not good if you don't know it yourself? So at least try and measure it. And I think the easiest way to measure it is with a number initially. And then at least you can kind of keep a trend of how you're feeling yourself. Yeah. Or you've been at three for about a month now, maybe try and change something up to get yourself over five. But yeah. yeah. So that's a, a good message to take away, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Very good advice. Liz, I've enjoyed this. Thank you for appearing on Hey Chower. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no worries. Let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, Good luck with everything. Honest to God. Good luck with anything, uh, everything. And uh, if people are looking to get the book, go and get the book. Highly recommend it. Read it myself. And then uh, the speaking gigs. Yeah. You're going to kill at that. Well, 100%. If they've, if they've got subtitles, then maybe on the screen. <laughs> but yeah. No, it should be good. I, I just want to... I love meeting people. I love engaging with people. So yeah, the, the more the merrier. Cool. Right. That's it. All done. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H-Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast starts getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to 
a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away give away gifts to my patron supporters, and it's all like well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events, so you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash. HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.